I recently heard about a solution to the housing crisis that uh, initially took me by surprise. It's renting, having more people rent their housing, specifically through a building known as a purpose-built rental. So I have a few questions. What the heck is a purpose-built rental? Why do we need more of these buildings? And can we really rent our way out of the... Well, I guess you read the title already. I keep standing up. Life is hard enough. I keep holding on. All right, you know the deal. If you're looking for a roof over your head, you essentially have two options. Rent pill or buy pill. <laughs> well, housing developers also have a similar choice. They can build housing to sell or housing to rent out. If they want to sell, they construct a building and sell each unit to individual owners. That is a condominium. If they want to rent, however, they keep that building and rent out each unit to tenants. That is a purpose-built rental. Its purpose, the only reason it exists, is to be rented out. Now here's the issue. In the past few decades, we've built very few purpose-built rentals. If you look at the data, you'll find that most of the ones we have today were built before 1980. So why is that? Why are most of our purpose-built rentals from the 50s, 60s, and 70s? Well, there's a pretty simple answer for that. The condominium hadn't been invented yet. Yeah, the idea that you can own your own little box in the sky is a relatively recent one that only became legally possible in British Columbia in 1966. But once condominiums hit the scene, it was pretty much game over for purpose-built rentals. Most housing developers found condominiums to be just way more lucrative to build. In the last 30 years, developers built 328,000 units of condominiums and about 67,000 units of purpose-built rental in Metro Vancouver. But these stats hide the fact that many purpose-built rentals were also lost over the years to redevelopment. When you add it all up, it's really quite shocking. According to the CMHC, Metro Vancouver gained a net 50 units of purpose-built rental since 1990. Five, zero. And you can really see this in the skylines of Metro Vancouver. Most of the new buildings you see are condos. That's a condo, that's a condo, those are condos, that's a condor, and yeah, that's a condo. We've built tons of housing for owners, but very little housing for renters. That is until recently. Many cities are now encouraging the construction of purpose-built rentals. In Vancouver, the city's working to make them more lucrative to build than condos. It's been waiving development fees, reducing parking minimums, and granting more floor space for developments if they're 100% for renting. This year, it will consider allowing developers to build taller and denser purpose-built rental buildings across the city. Up to six-story buildings on commercial streets and possibly four stories on some side streets. But it's not just Vancouver. In Burnaby, the city is now requiring all new residential developments to set aside at least 20% of their units for renters. And over in New Westminster, the city has even designated areas exclusively for purpose-built rentals, which got them sued. But ultimately they won, so hooray. You get the idea. Cities are trying to build way more purpose-built rentals. And at first, I thought this was a pretty good idea. Rents are expensive. If we build more purpose-built rentals, we create way more places to rent, we increase that vacancy rate, we decrease rents, and fix this housing crisis once and for all. Congratulations. I only wish it was that easy. You see how long this video is? It gets a bit more complicated. Building purpose-built rentals instead of condos won't necessarily add more rental units because purpose-built rentals are not the only places where you can rent housing. If you rent, you already know this. There are laneway houses, basement suites, regular old houses, and importantly, condos. Yes, it turns out 46% of condos in Vancouver are not occupied by their owner. And ever since Vancouver's empty homes tax and BC speculation and vacancy tax, most of them are being rented out. That has created a huge supply of rental units. Estimates vary, but according to the CMHC, there are currently 77,000 condo units that are rented out in Metro Vancouver, representing about 40% of the total rental market. And in many instances, these rented condos are actually cheaper than comparable units in purpose-built rental buildings. That's what a study found in Toronto, but you can see that here in Vancouver as well. In the West End, there's a new purpose-built rental apartment where one-bedroom units start at $2,300 a month. But just one block away is a condo where someone has listed their one-bedroom unit for only $2,000 a month. Plus, it's larger and closer to the beach. Now, there is one key benefit to purpose-built rentals. 
they are very stable places to live in. If you rent someone's condo, there is a chance that the owner will move back in or, or sell it to someone else and force you to move. A purpose-built rental tends to stay a rental for a very long time, and that gives you a lot of security. And depending on who you ask, they also tend to be more professionally managed as well. But if the main goal is to decrease rents overall, I'll be honest with you. It kind of doesn't matter if people are renting from a landlord who owns a condo or a landlord who owns a purpose-built rental. We just need way more housing in general across the board. And that still leaves us with the original question. Why should we specifically build purpose-built rentals? Well, I have a thought about this. I think this isn't so much about decreasing rents, but about getting more people to rent and fewer people to buy. And that gets to the very root of this housing crisis. Shall we get into it? Remember how 46% of condos in Vancouver are not occupied by their owner? Well, why is that? Why are people buying a condo that they don't live in? Well, it's because buying a home is not just about buying a place to live in, it's also an investment, something you own, and something that can go up in price. And recently, those prices have been going rocket ship emoji to the moon. It now costs more than 10 times the average household income to buy a home in Metro Vancouver. So uh, I'm gonna try to explain what's happening here with a little thing I call First, we start with the idea that buying a home is a good investment, especially in cities where the population is growing. Second, we encourage home ownership, and I can't overstate this enough. The provincial and federal government have a long history of providing huge incentives for people to buy a home through grants, tax deductions, tax credits, and low interest rates, while providing virtually no supports for people renting housing. At the same time, banks have made it easier to borrow more and more money for that home with smaller down payments and longer mortgages. All that increases the demand to buy housing and the ability for people to buy it. Third, we limit housing supply. Municipal governments have zoning bylaws that suppress how much housing can be built and often contend with general nimbyism from existing homeowners that make it politically painful to change those restrictions. We will run out of food, we will run out of water eventually. At some point, somebody has to stand up and say, we can't absorb any more. Well, this is where investors see an opportunity. People start to buy up housing even if they won't personally live in the home because it's a good investment. As long as housing demand is high and supply is limited, the value will keep rising. These are pension funds, REITs, individual investors, shadow flippers, Graham Stephan, and boomers who want to buy a second property, which all goes back to feeding the idea that housing is a good investment. Repeat that cycle again and again, and housing prices tend to spiral out of control. For some, buying housing is now akin to buying a stock, or Bitcoin, except that in this case, that Bitcoin is like an essential need, it's shelter. But renting is different. And I'm sorry if this is obvious. When you pay rent, you are not investing your money. You are paying for a utility, a service. Think of it like a gym membership. Nobody takes on huge amounts of debt to buy a gym membership. Nobody buys gym memberships they don't intend to use. And nobody in their right mind holds onto a gym membership to sell to someone else at a higher price. It's a gym membership. It's not an investment. It's a service that you temporarily benefit from. You might be building sick gains, bro, but you're not building your net worth. Well, that's how renting works too. People are strictly paying for the benefit of living in a space. So more people renting housing means fewer people owning housing, which means more people treating their housing like a gym membership and not Bitcoin. And over time, that can stabilize housing prices. Many point to Germany as an example. More than half the country rents their housing, and in Berlin that figure goes up to 82% of residents. The other thing that the Germans have got going on is a pretty stable housing market. Housing prices in countries with more home ownership have fluctuated wildly in the past two decades, but housing prices in Germany have been much more steady. Many attribute this to the country's culture of renting. Economist Dr. Vo uh, uh, Michael puts it this way, German households view homes simply as a consumption good, thereby ignoring the opportunities which arise from treating housing as an asset class. But there is a downside to having more of a renting culture. And I'm not talking about how homeowners make better citizens or whatever. I personally don't believe that. Uh, what I'm talking about is wealth inequality. Owning a house has historically been one of the most effective ways for people to build wealth. When you pay rent, you're spending your money, but when you pay your mortgage, you are investing your money. And once you own your house, you've built up a ton of wealth. 
From there, you can sell it or leverage it and then use that money to invest in a business, pay your grandkids through college, or have an awesome retirement. So having fewer people buying their housing creates a bit of a problem. It becomes much more difficult for people to build wealth. All that money that they could be spending on a mortgage to build their net worth ends up being a loss, paid through rents to the few people who are fortunate enough to own property. And that tends to create wealth inequality. A study by economists at the OECD makes this correlation pretty clear. Countries with low home ownership tend to see wealth accumulate to their richest citizens. Countries like Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And in those countries, wealth inequality might not be as much of a concern. They tend to have strong social support programs, free university, and great pensions, so people don't have much of a need to build wealth in the first place. But I'm not sure that's the case here, at least not yet. So should we embrace renting as a way out of this housing crisis? Well, I'm a bit conflicted. Yeah, if I'm honest with you, I would like to have the opportunity to buy housing and build my net worth, you know, in case this YouTube career doesn't work out. And many will point out that there are other ways to stabilize the housing market, like banning foreign buyers, having speculation taxes, or abolishing zoning bylaws. But I'll save that can of worms for another time. Because at the end of the day, it does seem like our obsession with home ownership at almost any cost is a big part of what got us into this housing crisis. Here in Canada, we are now approaching a home ownership rate of 70%. That's 70% of the population that's invested in their housing and wanting it to grow in value. But can you see how that's kind of at odds with our desire for housing to be affordable and accessible? So I think all this recent interest around purpose-built rentals suggests that we're at a bit of a crossroads with this issue. Should we continue to treat housing as an investment for the everyday person, or should we just treat it simply as a service? Should we continue to buy into this housing market, or should we try to rent our way out of it? And that's what we call bookending a story. But before I let you go, I want to thank Urbanarium, my partner and sponsor for this video. They're a local charity that supports education and discussion on Metro Vancouver issues such as this. Check them out when you have a chance.